So I was backstage um, looking up your market cap so I could make some sort of funny comment that wasn't funny. And you said if you were one of my employees, you would now have to go buy the office donuts for yeah. looking up oh, yeah. the stock price? Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're caught uh, checking um, market cap or, or stock price in the office on company gear, then you have to buy donuts for your team. <laughs> and is that a, that's a Shopify thing or you learned that elsewhere? No, that's, I think that's a, that, that sounds like a Shopify thing. <laughs> like, so, actually, I think you get a sense for probably the entire company by just knowing about that one thing, yeah. That, I think that does tell me a lot. And you know what I wanted to start with, um, besides donuts, maybe we'll have some later, um, was obviously all this talk about Amazon. And then on the other side, if you, if you only listen to the Amazon domination story, you'd be shocked when you look at a company of yours, like yours, with the size it is now, that has basically built its business by supporting everyone outside of yeah. Amazon in the digital world. So like, what, how is this both happening together? I think it, it talks to about material, like the size of the world thing, right? Like, um, I, I think this is, um, yeah, like, I built my entire career on, uh, especially Silicon Valley, under, underestimating online commerce, right? Like, um, it is a huge market. It is currently, like, and, and, and early. Um, so it, right now it's about $1.9 trillion um, uh, of, of online commerce going towards four trillion in the next couple of years. Probably the single largest uh, economic opportunity of our times. Um, now, what Shopify specifically does is, again, the, the company started in 2004 in Canada. Um, I sold snowboards, uh, um, I built an online snowboard shop and figured out, this was in 2004, um, that uh, like I thought E-commerce was figured out at this point. I mean, like Mark and Reason ran around telling everyone, you know, the Netscape IPO is because people use the internet for e-commerce, and therefore I figured we figured out, figured out e-commerce in the 90s. That didn't work out. Well. No, um, and 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 uh, interestingly, people did build a lot of e-commerce software, but they built it for a very specific reason, which is to uh, help existing businesses um, also sell online. That is very specific. Um, because existing businesses have a lot of, they, they, they have legacy systems, they have people, they have money, a lot of it, sometimes, at least the ones who are doing well. And um, against that backdrop, there was all these companies competing, but what I was doing was building a new business online, which is, I knew nothing about retail, I had no money, I had no time, I, had, uh, and, and I needed help for everything. Um, and so, um, after this realization of building uh, the snowboard store, we realized no one has actually built software to help people build online first businesses. Um, and then Shopify is the software I hoped I would have found in 2004 because I, I, I realized based on this realization I can, I, can, I can use what the code I wrote for Snow Devil and make Shopify out of it. So when I started covering Shopify maybe four or five years ago, um, that company in Canada that seems to be really big and Silicon Valley investors want to talk about, but they don't quite get. Um, you guys were known, or at least to me, known as a company that really helped support small online retailers and online brands. Yeah. Since then, you've made a big push. Um, I don't know whether it's just following your early customers or making a big push toward up towards enterprise type size companies. What is what was the strategy there? Yeah, um, uh, it's not a push. Um, so Shopify, it's really, Shopify is really all about what I just talked about. Like this, let's help, let's make um, entrepreneurship on the internet approachable to people who have never done it before. Um, that's, that's the heart of a company. Um, everything else that we're doing, the enterprise side, like the Unilever and Nestle and uh, all these kind of things happened because we are being pulled there. And so the, the reason why we are being pulled there is, is rather interesting. It's, it's the fact that, um, um, again, no one thinks about it this way, but it's absolutely true. The higher you go in any software market, the worse the quality of the software gets. And it's because 
the people who buy the software are not the people who actually have to use it. They, they, they throw it over a wall, like after they buy it, after six months on the golf course, they tend to then give it to people whose entire job is to, 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 to deal with whatever crappy thing it is. And um, Shopify- You really love your competitors. Well, like. and, and this is, by the way, this is true in, uh, in ERP software, in, 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 in HR software, this is literally true in every, every discipline. Uh, the moment there is no direct relation between purchasing behavior, um, like, like the, the, where the people who have to use the software buy it, the software quality is not the optimization target for the team behind it anymore. Um, it is planning sales, which you do via RFPs and so on, and, and, and this sort of strippers and stakes sales process that people love so much in that industry. Um, and um, uh, so I con contrast that to Shopify, which was forged in the fires of uh, people reaching for their own independence, doing the lunch breaks, and uh, trying to learn something about a very confusing and complex uh, market, um, but making it work, and, and then succeeding in many cases and building businesses for themselves, and, and, and really changing their entire life because of it. Um, that's what we have to support, and, uh, and, and, and then after we were pulled into sort of this enterprise more market, um, everyone like, responded with, finally, there's high quality software. Let's talk about the CPG space for a little bit. We'll get to the younger, fast-growing companies, but you mentioned Unilever, and I think you mentioned a couple other CPG companies. We just heard Scott say, predict that a couple of them are gonna have to merge or to, to bulk up against Amazon. Those companies, you know, for years and years and years, their business has been distributing through other retailers, and they still do so today. They're being squeezed on price by Walmart, squeezed on price by Amazon, and, and they're in the middle. Yeah. Um, you have some interactions with them, though, but it doesn't seem like we see a ton of example of CPG coming, companies going direct to consumer in a big way. So what, why are, when do you see them using Shopify and in, in what, what sort of situations? Yeah, it's really interesting. It was really a surprise to me, too, but it's, 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 a, I mean, it's a very big trend, and obviously I think everyone on stage is going to talk somehow about disintermediation and, and, and going direct to consumer, and the CPGs are not, no different. What happens there is really fascinating, though, because, um, and we see this play out, um, we suddenly have a, a, a sign up from Budweiser or from, uh, uh, from Anheuser-Busch or from uh, Nestle. And um, uh, of course, we, 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 are, we are curious about this because they help themselves to software, which is, again, not the traditional way of how software is procured. And um, what's going on? Uh, so these are people inside one of those big companies yes. going on to Shopify.com and using a personal credit card or something so to sign up? Precisely. Or? And so but here's a fascinating thing. These companies all have a, usually a, a chief information officer who owns commerce. Right? It's a department. Um, it often has many people, sometimes many hundreds of people, working on um, getting all their brands on this sort of online store, which is this, their online strategy. But internally, things are uh, full of friction. Like when a brand manager wants to say, hey, I'm going to launch a, a Budweiser campaign around the NHL, or I want to sell Lay's chips in, with some customization or something like this, they are going to the CIO and they go on top of a stack of an implementation. And hopefully, um, then the, after a period of wait, they're supposed to get this kind of thing. But that system is not working well. It's very obvious because we see it not work well, because at some point, the brand manager goes and uses their personal credit card to sign up for Shopify and just gets that store done over the weekend. So these are turf wars inside these big companies. Right, and we see, again, like, this is what I'm saying, we see this play out. You know, suddenly um, a new person, the CIO, is being CC'd on, on emails, and suddenly um, there, there's, a, there's a war between uh, various executives at this company over the uh, veracity of, 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 of going and doing it themselves. So I've, I've had a tough time trying to judge how real of a thing direct-to-consumer can be in the CPG space. Um, yeah. Just because these companies, their DNAs were built on distribution through partners. Right. So are you seeing signs that there is actual broad movement here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the way the story continued from there is in, in universally the brand managers won. Um, as, as soon as at some point a decision maker like the CEO got involved, they said, hey, this is great, this is way faster, this is way cheaper, we get to market, and, and, and the, crazy, the crazy thing is my marketing team can own the um, look and feel of the entire strategy suddenly, which is incredible, right? Um, 
And uh, so then in this case, we ended up like selling site licenses saying, hey, you, have, you can bring 50 brands or something like this, these kind of deals, because there's a real movement um, towards this much more distributed model. Um, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago that was about fast-growing digital consumer brands that had avoided largely raising venture capital and then it had pretty good, um, I heard some groans in the back from my VC friends, I'm sorry about that. Um, I, and, and you know, a couple of the things these companies had in common, we'll hear, hear from some tomorrow, Tough to Needle and Native uh, Deodorant. Um, one of them was that, um, whether it was Shopify or another software as a service, there was, there was a, a reason to get an easy way to get up and running pretty quickly. They did not need to raise tons of venture capital for their technology stack like some older digital companies like Bonobos did back in the day. Um, these companies were started maybe four or five years ago, and when cost to ac acquire customers online, it was a different formula. I'm curious, the companies that are starting today, right. are you thinking about, like how do you help them think about, if at all, you know, profitably building these companies online, either without outside investment, and how do you look at what we're seeing in the um, cost to acquire a customer landscape online across all these channels? I mean, obviously we have a front row seat to uh, this world, right? We are, we are seeing um, unbelievable brands being built um, in, 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 in absolutely record time. It used to be, like, even if you would have said here a year ago, it would, you would just have to take my word for it, but uh, like, we, we now have, thankfully, some of our uh, breakout success stories. Merchants are starting to actually share their stories, um, which I'm super glad uh, for. Um, so uh, Movement, which uh, you talked about, is a great example. Started as a uh, dropshipping business and sold for $100 million. Recently, they never took investment. Um, the um, uh, story of uh, the Kali Cosmetics, which was mentioned earlier, is now being told. This is a right. So this is for those who don't know Ka Kylie Cosmetics, Kylie Jenner's um, fast-growing yeah. business that runs on Shopify. Fast-growing sh business that runs on Shopify. It might very well be the could be the fastest-growing business ever. Um, it is. Uh, you probably have some internal sales data you can share with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, close to a billion-dollar business. Yeah. The uh, Shopify is uh, projected to hit a billion dollars of revenue this year. Several of our customers beat us to the punch. Do you want to lay, lay out for us the other ones? No. There's companies like Fashion Nova yeah. out in LA, which doesn't get a lot of attention in the business press, um, but is a very fast growing business that may or may not be one of those businesses that beat you to that number. You never know. You never know. So, I mean, at, do you get involved at all? I mean, how do you. You obviously want what's best for you is to have these businesses be sustainable, right? Yeah. And they can, and you make it easy for them to sell in other places, including Amazon. Right. But at the core, I would assume how they acquire customers and whether they do that in a profitable manner is is something that is core to. It, it's it's. I mean, we assist, but it's that is their business, right? Like, and, and so this is the beauty of Shopify right? to, to a degree, right? Like we take care of everything that isn't um, the ma product market fit component, right? So because we want, we want to make it so that it, like the experience of building these businesses is, 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 is purely determined by your like actual task skill set, rather than that you need a PhD on how to set, set up uh, servers um, to run your business that happened to stay up on the day, day you needed the most because at some point someone's going to talk about you if you're so lucky and then you get a lot of traffic and that's when everyone, everything falls over usually. And so um, we see um, every strategy that exists is being employed to, 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 to find customers. It depends entirely, like there's, you know, like not, not all of Shopify are the Kylie Jenner breakout success stories. It's often the yeah. Why don't the, we the, can, can the, we break the, down some of those percentages? Well, it's no, but like it's the the <laughs> library down on the corner is also using Shopify on their point of sale cash register and uh, like just so that because it happens to end up being the easiest way for them to uh, also be able to show the products that are currently in the store and not get sold on their website and so on, and that's a large part of constituency. There's, 
um, a customer from the very first cohort, um, 2006, it's, um, June 2006 when Shopify launched, which is, I mean, that is really 100 internet years ago, right? That's a really, really long time ago. Um, who, who started in the, like, signed up because we got the, the email from mailing list and they made a small business making uh, hand-woven baskets in the uh, east coast of Canada. And uh, it, it's great business. It's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. They, they travel, uh, they employ people locally, and uh, that's, that was exactly their goal and they have accomplished this too. So it, it's really, it, it's, a, it's a very broad, you go all the way from Procter & Gamble um, to the incredible success of, of, of Kylie. Again, seven people's staff. Like, the business is $900 million of sales after two and a half years. It took Nike 24 years to get to this point. These are the brands of tomorrow. It's, the, the stories are just so hard to even understand the scale of this, what, what's going on. Um, and then all the way to the, again, the people who are reaching for independence because that's really important to us. So at the same, you know, at the same time that you have um, really, really lowered the barrier to entry for like just about anyone. You said you handle basically everything but product market fit. The flip side of that is it's really, really easy to start up a Shopify shop. It's really, really re easy to start advertising a product, whether or not you're actually building it yeah. in the world. And so, you know, there have been some great stories which you may or may not have liked about, you know, what the weird Instagram brands and things of that nature, or burner brands, which are brands that appear to be real but turn out to be either really not what they were advertising. Right. What is your what is Shopify's role in making sure that the companies that build on your platform are putting out the product they say they are? Genuine. Yeah, no, we, we enforce that people for companies are genuine, right? Like um, you, you you can't sell knockoffs. Um, there, there's a there's an acceptable use policy uh, on Shopify which creates uh, like a space um, for in which entrepreneurship can happen. And if you're not if you don't deliver your products um, on our platform, we just because of machine learning and all these kinds of things, we, we can usually tell um, that uh, a store before it ever sells anything, so that's actually no problem. The problem is you could usually tell. Sorry, you could usually tell why. Yeah, like just pro the product pictures have, we've seen it before, or like this, I mean, like this, try to ask um, a machine learning algorithm how it's doing its thing. It's not <laughs> often, uh, they, no one really knows, but like we, we have a very high hit rate on these kind of things. So this is actually the good news about um, us being a platform with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of merchants because um, we, we, we can use at scale um, uh, the kind of policing that is useful. The problem is, of course, after we say you can't use this or you can't do this thing that you're doing, people can always help themselves to if they have a capability, a server somewhere, and then sign up, uh, put some open source software on it, and they're back, right? Yeah, because my, you know, when you look at the platform businesses in the media world and sort of their responsibility right. or lack thereof for what's on their platform, right? Right, and and slightly different. These are I'm talking about consumer consumer facing businesses while you're B two B. You know, there's been an, you know up until recently, it's largely been, you know, we just make the platform. And so I just, long term, I wonder if there's even any potential damage, like trying to figure out if you should care about that yeah. long term because what is the, what is the threat for you? No. Obviously there's threat to the consumers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think via a platform, uh, every platform company has to kind of figure out, like, like every, I think one thing the internet learned in the last two years, um, uh, and, and in some cases, this is quite public uh, in, in case of some businesses, is that everyone really has to create um, uh, something like an acceptable use policy that just says, here's the confines of what, in, in which you can act. And it's important that every company reserves the right to wake up smarter every day and potentially, uh, as things change, make some adjustments to, um, to these policies. and then stick to them. Like the problem I think a lot of platforms have been running into is they, they had these situations, but for expediency they didn't end up enforcing them. And then once certain actors drove it too far with the violations of the platforms, they, they had to reconsider and then enforce them and that felt very arbitrary and selective. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing you've talked about a lot over the years, your company has, is 
helping these uh, internet businesses find their customers wherever yeah. they might be. Yeah. Different sales channels. For years I wrote about buy buttons on the social media sites. They, they largely did not work, although we're seeing different iterations on that now. Yeah. Where, when you hear the phrase social commerce, like what, do you, like what does that mean to you today? And is there, where is the potential there? It's huge. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely massive and it's alive and well. It's just that we have not figured out how to natively build it. it, all, it all, it's, it's still, it's largely powered by someone buying, purchasing an ad, you go to a website, and then it, it's, you're broken out of a kind of experience. Um, we saw one initial run at, hey, let's add a buy button to Twitter or something, and you know, there was no customer demand for that. Like, there's a process of understanding the product, and like, purchasing directly from a tweet doesn't make sense. But, um, uh, you know, we, we will see more uh, in the sort of brainstorming. But, 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 but Pinterest or Instagram does, or? I mean, I would say specifically, like Facebook, Instagram are large drivers of, of, of purchasing traffic. I mean, this is where you mentioned the sort of Instagram brands. Like, I, 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 some of those things we were talking about, hey, those are like Instagram brands, as if this is like somehow a bad thing. Um, there are bad ones and there are there, good ones. There are bad ones. And some of them are going to be the Nikes or in 20 years. Like, this is playing out. Like, this is um, the way to go direct to an audience is, has completely changed. Um, the possibilities for small businesses are massive because of um, the we, because of the uh, way platforms work. Tw 20 years ago, we only had television, right? Like te television and billboards. Like how would you have even created a relationship with all the billboard companies if you, uh, the movement? Like you couldn't have, right? Would you have done television ads? You know how capital int int intensive uh, TV ads are? Now, these platforms are massive enablers of distribution. And this is really important, right? Because we got all the way here because we started talking about, hey, there's Amazon, this is like 50%. At least in the United States, uh, and then there's the rest. Um, that's obvious because that's what the internet always does. The internet massively benefits centralization in every category. Um, one solution for everything. There's one store. There's one social network, and so on and so on. Um, what we do, what Shopify does, is we have successfully, I think, built a business model um, uh, around helping people get a part of that slice. Like, preserving the ability for people to actually start online business, which I think is super important. Like, I was one, like, I, I, I grew up not really fitting in. I don't think I could have ever looked for anyone. Um, and so, my only option at some point was this, like, reach for independence, which I keep talking about. And as, because I was, I'm a computer programmer, I actually succeeded in this. But looking back, I was saying, I only succeeded in this because I was a computer programmer. And how sad would it be that um, if the only people who can um, partake in this massive economic wealth creation are going to be the people who hit, hit the middle of a Venn diagram between having a product, finding a market, and being able to program computers, or at least set up computers and maintain them to stay up. That seemed diminishing. And so um, Shopify is, again, this exercise of um, take the crazy learning curve that's involved in starting businesses um, and try to push it down as far as possible and allow people to uh, run an attempt at this. And what you sometimes see on Instagram, to be fair, and uh, that's worthy of criticism, but it's unfortunate, the, 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 the truth of the matter and has always existed, is um, some of those are failed attempts. Um, but they're not failures. What we see is a lot of entrepreneurs, when they engage in this kind of thing, what they will do is they will try again and again. Every single attempt of starting a business is actually the successful discovery of something that did not work. And on that path, eventually they find success and then start building these brands. And that's really important to us. That's a positive way to, to look at it. But speaking of positive, you talk about independence a lot here. Um, you are. A, $16.5 billion public company. At the same time, there are a lot of smart people who say, geez, Shopify would be a great piece of Facebook and Instagram. Shopify would potentially be a great piece of Google. Um, if I talk to you two years from now on this stage, um, 
in New York City, hopefully again. Will we still be talking about independence, or is there a world in which you actually would benefit from being a part of the big four? I mean, so after my so after the initial experience of starting Snow Devil, I at, at some point, you know, again, I built the software and I got an email from the software, um, which I wrote at some point, which said that I had my first sale, right? Like this, someone in Pennsylvania purchased my the first snowboard. It was, um, I, I'll, I'll never forget this day. It, it's an, it, you should talk to any retailer in the, like you ever meet and say, hey, when did you do your first sale? And they describe the day and what they're wearing and what they ate and all these kind of things. It's, an, it's, a, profound, it's a profound experience. It's a life-changing uh, um, experience. And in fact, in some instances, it, it's an identity-changing uh, experience because your children or grandchildren will describe you as an entrepreneur rather than whatever you were before. So um, uh, from that moment, like, Shopify was a very long exercise in me. Every single time I got a choice um, between two paths that were valid to go forward, um, if one of those paths led to more entrepreneurship happening in the world, I always chose that one. So the question is, if someone would have to make a plausible case to me why it would be better for entrepreneurship in the, in the world and there would be more entrepreneurship and more space for it, um, after acquiring Shopify, um, to even have this conversation, because that's the only thing this company is all, is all about. I don't. I really think that the power of Shopify is its independence, and that it comes from um, us being able to, uh, you know, work with everyone in the industry rather than have to declare fealty at the altar of one of those oversized uh, uh, quasi-monopolies. And I think um, I, I, I would like to preserve that. You don't want to be part of a quasi-monopoly, do you? Uh, well, my own, maybe. <laughs> um, we're going to take some audience questions. Uh, I'm sure there are some. There are two mics right here. Uh, coming up. Great. Just please identify yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm David Escamilla with Abdiel. And I, I'd like to get your thoughts on how Shopify might um, compete for that startup merchant uh, if, say, a social platform begins offering, uh, you know, very bare bones uh, e-commerce solutions. So, how we help in those instances? Or, Pardon. So, so the question is, how we would help in these instances, or how we compete with that? Um, how you would differentiate uh, yourself? Uh, yeah. yeah, and compete with it. And there are a couple of hypotheticals I have in mind. I mean, so like we, we tend to be first call when anyone wants to add um, comments to anything, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are usually in the office saying, "Hey, here's like how we can do this." Um, even and, and so in 99% of everything that's announced, when someone says, "Hey, we're like becoming, uh, we're, we're enabling commerce," um, you can. The, the way you do that as a merchant is you have a Shopify account, which most at this point have, and then um, you add that social platform or whatever it is, let's say house, which is like sort of furniture kind of thing. You add that as a channel to your Shopify store, you select the products, and then you post them from Shopify in there. And um, let's, in some cases, these platforms also have like a simplified, like just broker the transaction, kind of component so people can just try it. But I always find that's a little bit naive because 98% of all the code in Shopify that exists is about what happens after or around the transaction. Like I wrote the code that brokers the payment in 2005 and it hasn't changed much because that's the simple bit. Um, but the difficult thing is going to a warehouse, getting the right things on the road, informing customers and all the, everything that's uh, integrated. So. Um, even if you're not integrated from day zero of a new feature in, com in the commerce world um, uh, uh, being launched, um, the merchants who are successful on that will come to the platform and say, please, we need the Shopify integration so that, um, uh, that we, we can actually make sense of the business we are running. So you're saying you would be surprised if there's a social platform that has a native commerce experience where they're selling directly to their consumers and you guys are not involved in some way. Right. Um, at some point, Shopify and uh, maybe even some other platforms will have to be integrated because it's the only way to make sense of it. Remember, like going in a new sales channel, um, is like even five years ago, or, or actually not even, right now, for most companies in the world, is a board of director level decision with a implementation plan that takes a year and probably a complete duplicate of a team um, that, that handles the previous um, sales channels. But on Shopify, we have businesses that are 
half a year old, they sell, they already sold five million dollars of product and they are selling across six or seven different sales channels. Partly because we took something that used to be that difficult and turned it into a single click, hey, at Instagram channel and be off to a races kind of situation. Hi, um, I'm Elena. I work at Gilder Gagnon Howe, an investment firm. Uh, I was just wondering, we've seen a lot of brands recently that were started on Shopify sort of move into brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that's something that's taken you by surprise and if that's sort of changed any of your plans or any of Shopify's plans. So it, it didn't take us by surprise. And it, I think we correctly uh, uh, anticipated this. Um, the first additional sales channel that we ever launched was point of sale product. So um, in, in both cases, you will go, like, I mean, I just on my way here, like through a meatpacking district, um, like the, half of the business we passed are Shopify customers, um, most of which use Shopify point of sale in the stores. Um, so because again, I, again, I'm sure this is a theme you're going to hear a lot about, but there is no such thing as e-commerce really. It's, it's a convenient thing to talk about, uh, but it's um, uh, e-commerce, like so selling in your own online store is a tactic in the larger strategy of a business and, and selling, in, uh, uh, like selling everywhere is, has to be part of it too. And so we enable all of that. Um, so the customers who need to, the merchants who need to sell across a lot of different channels tend to use Shopify and that's, that's why you see it a lot. Thanks. And then we um, one more quick one right here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Frankie. I'm here independently. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the Shopify Plus product roadmap? Like, what do you see it two years from now, five years from now, and so forth? <laughs> also, how are you going to prioritize Shopify Plus versus um, the normal Shopify platform? Yeah, we did something really neat. So Shopify Plus, again, is the more upmarket thing, which we created as a demand of being pulled into this world. We actually, um, because most companies stretch, uh, no, sorry, most companies move up market, which we wanted to really prevent because of a hard our businesses with their entrepreneurship. Um, we decided the way we're going to do this is we put walls around it. Um, so it actually exists in its own office in a different city. Um, it uses the same basic code base, but that's the way the company works. And um, uh, initial couple of years were just build up this, uh, th this team and um, uh, modify Shopify through like account management and all these kind of things to, to the expectations of this market. Now we have a very, very strong roadmap that uh, will help customers go global faster and uh, you know, do a lot of uh, the ki like multi-location uh, ma warehouse management is something that is a big deal in, in this world, which is launching. Um, and uh, I, I mean, at Unite, we talk quite a bit about Plus because there's a lot of interest, but um, we, we did that by separating teams and, and separating locations and trying to be the first company that successfully manages to stretch up market rather than go up market the way Salesforce and others have done it. Okay, I lied. I'll give you one more question, yes. but super short answer, super short <laughs> I question. I promise it's a good question. Um, okay. I'm, a, I'm Leticia Miranda. I'm a retail reporter with BuzzFeed News. Um, and I um, have spoken to a few people from Shopify. And from what I understand, um, Shopify's relationship to Amazon is mostly symbiotic. A lot of your yeah. sellers use it as like an advertising platform. Um, so today, Amazon announced it has Amazon storefronts, which seems to be sort of cutting into your market, um, where they're going to be featuring small to medium-sized businesses. So how does that change the relationship that Shopify has had with Amazon? I mean, it's a tech industry, right? We are all frenemies. We are all kind of overlapping, and it, it, I don't think anyone particularly cares about this. And, um, and uh, Lots Care, of our cares about their new launch or cares no, about no, no, their no, no, cares about oh. like we're all sort of doing stuff that some other people do as well, and I think that's okay. Um, again, Shopify's worldview is the merchants are super important. We need them for the future of our economies. We need millions of small SMBs rather than a few mega companies. We need uh, um, they are the drivers of new product creation. They are the drivers of great customer experience. Uh, Amazon's worldview is that merchants don't matter and factories and consumers matter and everything between that is uh, Jeff's opportunity. And um, so uh, there's a storefront product which I think is mostly a marketing kind of uh, exposure for, for, for some uh, merchants and I don't, like it feels a little bit like a trap to me. <laughs> so um, I think we will have to wait a couple of years and look back and if someone would come with a time machine and tell me, hey, Amazon launched this today, but in a couple of years, um, merchants decided that giving all their business data uh, to, to, to Amazon um, 
and then starting to compete for on the buy buttons with every factory in the world didn't work out as that good of an idea, then I would not be surprised. I think that's a perfect place to end. Thank you, Toby. Thanks.